coming, despite it being the beginning of your finals period. Uh, it's our pleasure to have uh, Misha Schlaff Smith uh, visiting from the MIT Media Lab, where uh, from, she just graduated with her PhD. And before that, she got her degree in architecture, undergrad degree in architecture uh, in India. And yet, uh, I think she's extremely relevant for us here at the Information Theory Forum, because much of what you'll see that she does is about information for presentation and communication and processing. Uh, and so I just let you hear from her. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you everyone for coming as I hear next week's finals. I don't know how many of you have finals, but good luck. And again, thanks for showing up to the talk today. Um, thank you for the introduction. As Saki mentioned, my area of research is human-computer interaction. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about using the entire body as an interface, both for input and output. Um, that's mostly what my work focuses on. Um, so how can new technologies allow us to interact with digital content in the most direct and natural way? This question has essentially driven interaction design for decades. I don't know how many of y'all have seen that demo, but if you haven't, so you want to. All right, so if you think about the last 50 years of computing, interaction has gone from Interaction has gone from punch cards to keyboard and mouse to touch and to voice. And simultaneously, the size of devices have gone from room-sized computers to things that we can carry in our pockets and use from anywhere else in the world. So more recently, wearables and AR VR devices have brought computing in direct physical contact with the user's body. And so with every transition over time, we've gone Interaction has become a lot more direct, and the devices have come closer to the human body, and the types of things that we can do have become a lot more personal. So gone are the days when we only use machines to crunch numbers, we now actually use our devices to manage our lives, to share our experiences, communicate, all these things. And my research asks the question, what is the next logical step? Where are we actually headed? Or where do we want to go? And my long-term vision is that an increased level of natural interaction will help raise devices and immersive systems from these external tools to things that are truly an extension of us. If we think about the distance between the real and the digital, it is clearest at the interface layer. The ways that our bodies interact with the real world are elaborate and rich and digital interactions, on the other hand, a lot more limited. Now my research looks at, or my goal is essentially to create devices and immersive systems that use the entire body as an interface in order to support natural and implicit interactions. I call my concept perceptual engineering. That is a way to manipulate a user's perception or to subtly alter it. And for example, we can manipulate a user's sense of space, sense of place, body, orientation. We can change their, uh, we can manage their visual attention and do all of these implicitly in order to assist or guide their interactive experience in an effortless manner. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk about four systems that essentially demonstrate different ways of manipulating user perception. We're gonna look at an automatic VR generation system. We're gonna look at a scuba diving simulator. We're gonna look at how we use cognitive illusions to manipulate perception and sense of scale of the space. And then lastly, look at how we can use vestibular stimulation to give you the physical sensations of motion even if you're not physically and maybe if we have time, we'll look at physiological signals. All right, so the, this work, I essentially wanted to build a way to automatically generate and adapt virtual worlds to any given user's physical space. And the idea was that you want to take something that's super familiar, something like a person's home, 
and transform it into something that's entirely new. So it's actually manipulating their sense of place and where they are. Now, virtual worlds can be pretty amazing places. You can see on the left-hand side, really well-designed spaces that invite exploration and often mm. present all the affordances of walkability. However, as you see here, most of the time, people are either sitting or standing when they're exploring these beautiful landscapes. And prior research shows that walking is the most natural form of locomotion in VR. It induces the highest sense of presence. And so our added goal in this project was that we wanted to allow people to be able to walk naturally in generated virtual worlds. Now the challenge is that devices are essentially tethered to the devices that we were using. So how can we do that? Um, so the solution to the problem was that we take a physical space and we do a 3D scan of the space and use that as a template to generate virtual worlds. And so on the left hand side, we scan the hallway, we got the planters and the pillars, and this is the space we end up generating from that. So we can use the affordances of the physical space, but visually what we see is entirely different, which means now we can walk in this space. And we look at the user experience, we see the person in the hallway, and this is a very early version in this we use the Oculus DK2 as a VR device, and we use the Kinect to do the full skeleton tracking, right? So you only have limited distance that a person can walk since the Kinect can only track you maybe 12 feet out or something. Um, so this was like a super early prototype, but you can see the person can look at their entire body, their skeleton's tracked, and they're walking freely in this generated world. For the final, project, we ended up using the Google Tango tablet device, which had just come out. This is around early 2016, and this device has a depth sensor in the back. And so that allowed us to use the device both as a 3D scanner as well as a 3D or a VR viewer. So we can just place it in a viewer with lenses, and this becomes our VR device. This is the pipeline of the entire system where you start out with 3D reconstruction, you do an analysis of point cloud to determine where the open spaces are, um, and then you generate the virtual world. And we also had a parallel pipeline, which is more like a pre-processing pipeline where we're doing object detection, essentially looking for chairs in the user's virtual environment so that we can place a virtual chair that corresponds to whatever it is that we recognize. But since that's hard to do on the device given the computation, we had to do it pre-processing on a desktop and actually place the virtual world chair. So if a new chair showed up, then we have to run the whole thing again, right? Um, so that's definitely challenging. And if we can do recognition on board on devices, it'd be on this super cool. So I'm mostly gonna talk about the first pipeline. And visually, this is kind of how the setup works. You start out with a physical space, you do a 3D scan, so you get a point cloud of that space. And now we analyze or process the point cloud to separate out the open walkable areas from the obstacles, furniture, walls, and all these things. And then use the generated output as input into um, generating a virtual world. All right. So video tour shows an overview and an example of a generated world. Don't need to walk that slowly, I'm only doing it for the video. So scanning the entire hallway was less than two minutes.
improve their position and orientation in real time, we can actually do some interactivity also automatically. We don't have to program it or pre program it. Essentially, you saw in the video what we're doing is we start out with a point cloud of the 3D scan, the space that we 3D scan, and we separate it out into floor and optical point clouds by fitting a plane. And then the floor points and the optical points, we then project them down onto the floor to get a top view of each of those spaces. And then that gets combined in order to give us an overall walkable area. This is what we're going to use to generate our virtual world. And this walkable area, before we use it, we sort of <coughs> use a road filter to shrink the space a little bit so we're not right up against obstacles and also to account for tracking the construction errors that might exist. And then look for large contours in this space because this will form the actual um, virtual space that we design. Once we have that, then we want to do the word generation, which is three types of data we have, or three types of elements, I should say. We got the static elements, which is your ground terrain and the skybox, and we add those first. And then you have the boundary elements, which are the ones that go around the detected walkable area. Because you still don't want the person walking out of that space. They're going to run into some obstacles, right? So visually, you want to block them. Um, and then lastly, you sort of populate the world with a lot of other elements so it seems like the place is alive. It's not just a boundary and walkable area. And then the placement of all of these obstacles, or objects, I should say, is based on the rule-based system where the rules define the spatial orientation and proximity relative to the walkable area, as well as relationships between <coughs> these places. So like the house or barn door should face the walkable area, or you know the horse should not be on top of the house, or whatever it is. So rule-based, and then we use the genetic algorithm to sort of optimize the placement generate our final output. All right, so the same physical space, depending on what kind of 3D models, data we collected, the data set we built, we were able to generate different types of virtual environments. And so the user can say, I want to be in a lava space or mountain or whatever, farmyard space. And that's the space we'll end up being in. Okay, so that was for one space, one user. And things get a lot more challenging now when you have two different physical spaces and two different users. And of course, many more users, many more spaces, all the more challenging. So how do we generate um, a shared virtual space where multiple users can actually interact as if they're in the same physical room when they're coming from different physical spaces? And so we implemented two solutions. And one was to take each person's walkable area and then just place it in the virtual world side by side, so they at least be in the same virtual space. Um, the other solution was to look for all possible um, you know, combinations of one overlapping the other, try to find the best and the largest overlap space. And the limitation in this case is that you lose out on a lot of your own walking area, because now you're limited to this combined walkable space. But it lets you interact with the other person, and you can walk around as if it's in the same room. So if you have two people in different physical spaces are in the same virtual space, and then they can see each other's bodies. And the bodies are not really tracked. They're animated bodies. We don't have a way to track it in an inside out system. Um, but they can at least interact with one another and see each other. In the other solution, they can see each other. They can't really walk over to the other person's space. Now you're gonna need a secondary type of navigation mechanism, which is can't walk through walls. And then since we had all the data, we went ahead and implemented people being in the same space and being able to play simple interactive games which are based on body position and orientation, like tic-tac-toe on the ground there. And lastly, an asymmetrical setup where one person is on a PC or a tablet or some other device and the other person is in VR and how do they interact with one another. And this has its own set of challenges, which we haven't really um, followed up and actually tried to resolve yet. 
but the PC person, of course, can move around a lot faster than the VR person who's walking around, and they just have a different type of view into the world, so how do their interactions work out, and what kinds of problems you have in designing that space. All right, just to quickly summarize that the system did allow automatic creation of virtualized worlds, and people don't have to clear out the space like you have to do for the HTC Vive, which is essentially a square or a rectangular space. It could be any shape or size, right? Um, and the virtual generation world happened fairly quickly, or at least that size space, be like a couple of minutes from scanning to getting the world to be able to experience it and walk around in it. It also supported natural walking, which was one of our initial goals that people can move around, which then led to high sense of presence. And secondly, social interaction in the combined walkable space, being able to see the other person's body and movements and all those things led to a high sense of realism. Um, all right, so for a point of impact, there's a couple of startups that are trying to recreate this and bring it out into the consumer domain, and lots of challenges remain. Right, just generating 3D spaces is not, um, it's not so simple yet. And then it provides a fast way for developers or casual users, people who don't have the skills or the time to be able to generate quick spaces for whatever purpose they need, whether you're doing a cognitive science experiment in your room space or you are in a doctor's office and you want to set up a therapy space, like it's a quick scan of your space to recreate it. Um, so seemingly there's applications, there's lots of areas, wherever you need. And if you're designing a virtual world, you need a virtual space. So wherever it is that you need the space, you can use a quick method to design the space and then do all the rest um, manually or partially manually. And then lastly, um, we have a set of design tools to support this generation process. And we're working on building a pipeline that actually allows a human to be part of the procedural generation pipeline, sort of create a hybrid system. So it'll lead to a little bit more creative output and see how we can support that in the system. Um, as I mentioned, there's certainly a lot of open problems in this space because really there's no good way to generate a 3D model of a space quickly using 2D images, videos, that we can actually push out an app right now and let people do that, right? And do it in real time. Um, so we can do that and at some point, maybe like field-based capture will happen and we'll actually get all the benefits of depth and um, 3D. Um, we don't have a way, at least not that I know, that can do object recognition fairly well on a mobile device. You can do, you can buy a compute stick and plug it into a Raspberry Pi and do it that way. But on a phone, if you want to do object recognition reliably and then also be able to track it when the person is using the whole system, um, it is a problem. And then combining, generating the combined walkable area it's a slow process because you're sort of trying to look at all possible combinations of orientations and translations of one relative to the other. So you can start out, as we did, doing the course resolution in sort of larger increments of those, and then resolve it once you find some optimal design. But if you, this was two people, but what if you have four? And then exponentially it just grows, right? And the area might start shrinking, and then it starts to lose benefits also, then maybe people can't walk so much anymore. So that needs to be solved. Um, again, like I said, maximizing the combined walkable area. What's a good way to do that? How can people still use their own entire walkable area, but also still be part of the combined area and not lose out on that space? Um, and lastly, body tracking for inside out systems. Like what is it that's looking at you or how do you track the whole body instead of all the joints and give a person um, an embodied experience? All right, so this one, we looked at how to create a multimodal experience that manipulates a lot of the user senses um, in a scuba diving simulator. Now we, on the left, uh, diving, I believe, gives you access to some of the most amazing habitats and species on the planet, but diving doesn't work out for everybody for many reasons could be age limitations, cost, where you live, access, and personally for me, the fear of water. Like, I still want to go underwater and see all these spaces, but I am too afraid to do it. Um, and so we decided to build a scuba diving simulator which will work on land. And there is prior work 
that looks at building guided experiences, whether it's in a PC game or um, in a cave-like VR system or something like Aqua Cave, which is a project out of um, University of Tokyo where you actually have to be in a tank of water. And that's not what we wanted to do because we wanted to be water. Um, and the goal was to try to replicate some of the sensations that we feel in the water because of buoyancy, drag, breath control. How do you simulate all of those things? All right, so this is what the final setup ended up looking like. Um, so we have our entire frame, which is built out of 8020s, and there's rollers that move around in the 8020s that are attached to these neoprene bands. And they are, of course, with slightly different resistances. And they are attached. This is sort of how the person is. They're not exactly suspended because most of their weight is on their torso. They're laying down in this um, spring base. So the spring base gives you a little bit of movement, a little bit of movement in all these axes. And then there's a, an inflatable cushion here, which is connected to the snorkel that has a gas sensor. So every time a person breathes in or breathes out, we are detecting their breath. <coughs> and I think we exaggerate a little bit because it's just very little. Um, and then inflate and deflate the cushion accordingly. So when you're underwater and you breathe in and out, you kind of go a little bit up and down like this. Um, what else? So we used cooling gel pads because we wanted to simulate temperature changing as you go deeper into water. But we also had a healthier thermoelectric cooler attached to the glove because prior work shows that localized cooling applied to the wrist leads to a general body-wide sensation of coolness. Um, what else is going on? Okay, so there's your visuals, there's your audio, and then we build some gloves that have an IMU to track your orientation and movement, and also flex sensors, just on the index finger and the thumb, so we can detect a grabbing gesture. And so when you grab something, there's an inflatable ball under it, and to give you haptic feedback, the minute you grab something, the ball inflates, and when you let go, the ball deflates. And for haptic feedback, we actually tried building gloves that have a lot of inflatable pockets, so we could inflate them when needed, but the sensation with the glove, uh, with the ball was much better than the resolution we had inflating a lot of the pockets. But now there's a startup that does that thing. I don't know if you guys have seen haptics. They have about 130 pockets, which is a lot, and they can simulate a lot of different types of um, touching and textures and things like that. So that's really cool. Um, I'll be on the palm of the hand. The entire hand. Yeah, so you can feel, apparently, I haven't tried it, but you can feel something as light as, I don't know, a drop of water or a feather because they can inflate selectively the parts that need to be inflated. But it's a huge device. It's four pounds of stuff on your hand. Because it also has force feedback, so you, you know, you can stop or grab things. What about beyond the hand? So far, they only have a hand. I think they're also working on an exoskeleton to try to do the whole body. Um, but I haven't really seen it. Hopefully, it will work that way. Okay, this is what the view looks like. I mean, it's underwater. The water is not super clear. It's murky. And the bubbles are connected to your breathing sensor. So as you breathe out, the bubbles show up here. Sound, of course, is muted. And then you have the whole environment. And you see your hands. But that's all you, I mean, hands is the only part of the body you see. Nothing else. Okay, so to evaluate how well it compared to an actual diving experience, uh, we tested it with scuba divers, and our requirement was that you should have completed at least 25 dives before coming to the study. And since it's VR, we also wanted to see how high or how low, whatever their sense of presence was like in this um, VR experience, did they actually feel like they were really there? And so we used these questionnaires to do that. And also recorded, video recorded everything so that um, we could then transcribe it and code it and then analyze data. Um, interview data that way. So the codes from the video transcription we used to categorize the questions in the with my single questionnaire into these seven main categories and then you know we did a chi-square test on the distribution of participants and in these um, three main categories per question group. And so we can see that breathing and audio did fairly well and people seem to like them the most whereas kinesthesia 
what's the beast like? And Tennessee Tale is the movement that you're doing, which we learned you don't really do swimming gestures when you're diving underwater. You mostly just move your legs. So we could, we had an idea installed on the legs and you have to block them to move forward, but this is not needed. Um, and visuals were rated not realistic, which is true. It's a cartoony virtual environment. Um, and temperature, surprisingly, most people did not feel. And what we learned was that they didn't feel the temperature because lying down like that, suspended, just the whole act of doing this was way too strenuous and people were pretty much sweating. The big old headset on their faces, so everything was just way too hot. And the temperature changes so little that they just didn't notice it. Yeah. Um, how, how did you guys um, measure the room I don't know, I forget, I forget if you used the same. Uh, we used a gas sensor attached to the snorkel. So the question is, where did your mouth and the sensor from elements? Um, all right, so overall, presence was high, which is great, right? We had all the visual and audio. People had some sense of agency. They could move themselves, go up, down, sideways, however they wanted to, um, somewhere around underwater. But realness, as Anisita pointed out, was low because it was really exhausting just being in that position. So we need to sort of come up with a better way of how can we make it a lot more comfortable. And then our movements was not how people do it. So here you can sort of see the snorkel, and then uh, everything is kind of built to point out. But since then, you know, we've had museums, and MIT Museum wanted to demonstrate it and put it up as an exhibit, several others, and people, divers said they would like to use it for training so that they don't have to go all the way out, um, whatever it is, you know, you can do it quickly, but to be able to use it as training, the system needs to match real diving a lot more closely. You've got to have the tanks and the valves and all those things. Uh, and then NASA uses VR for their space station training. A lot of times for emergency procedures, if you sort of become untethered from the space station. And right now they do it as the person is just sitting down and manipulating something. But if they could bodily do it, I believe that it will actually be a lot more helpful because when you get untethered, you don't really know which way you're facing, and you only have about, I don't know, 10, maybe 30 seconds or something like that, like a really short time to figure out your way, get back to the space station and grab onto it, because they really can't rescue you if you're lost in space. Um, education was pointed out by the divers as another possible use case scenario, and then, of course, gaming and entertainment. And lastly, musical therapy, whether it's breathing, it's physical therapy, we're looking at muscle, gait, all kinds of things, or mental, you know, looking at relaxation techniques or meditation or something. All right, so challenges again, body tracking is a problem. Now you're laying down like this, and at the time when we built it, the vibe wasn't there, so vibe trackers didn't exist, right? And we're tracking the hands using an IMU, we're using leap motion hand models, and and all sorts of things to make sure that it aligns with the real world hands. Um, body tracking is definitely challenging. It could be much better now. Now we can put body trackers and sort of do it. Sensations need to be improved. Like drag was essentially coming from the resistance bands that are moving with rollers on the AU20, but it was also the least liked. And so we need to improve that temperature when we felt at all. But temperature is kind of an important sensation as you go, depending on how you go. Um, we want to build, be great to be able to build something that's an inexpensive six degrees of freedom system so you can actually move a lot more in this axis when you're underwater. Because when you're actually underwater, you can do a lot more. You have a lot more freedom than our system allows. Um, you know, wider field of view devices and a cooler head mounted display would be super helpful. And I know you can put fans and have them displays that blow air and all those things. Um, still something to work on. And lastly, haptic gloves. How can we feel shapes of things, textures, weights of things? Um, and you know, I mean, a lot of Sean's work will come in here to uh, figure it out. All these sensations again, you could feel in the water, even though we were told you're not really supposed to touch anything in the water. So. And lastly, people pointed out visual realism. So how can we make it work with stereo 360 captures of some sort where the user still has agency and can control the camera and move through a scene um, 
but is realistically that's coming from a video capture as opposed to a 3D model system. Or if you model it and try to render it as realistically as possible. But this was running on a little laptop at the time and certainly do better. Uh, question? Yeah. So how much does the whole system cost? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. We built two systems, you oh. know, so cost First one was wood based and it was a bit smaller and then we did an open lab demo and then we got some feedback. It didn't have all the breathing or anything, so we added on and over time built it. So I don't know how much it costs. It's not super it should be super expensive I would think, because off the shelf parts to sort of assemble it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah there's yeah. motors and pumps and you got the wheels and valves and all these things. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure there's lots of optimizations that can be right. done to actually improve the system. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Oh. All right, so in this project, I was looking at a couple of techniques based on cognitive illusions and how we can use them to manipulate a user's sense of space or skill, right? And challenge that we took upon ourselves to solve was that in VR you want to walk on a straight long path, but physically you're limited to, at least for the vibe, to a squarish space where you're in. So how do you give the user a sensation that you're walking on a straight path without them noticing that they're turning around every two seconds? Do that. There's of course prior work in this area and it's called redirected walking, where the basic idea is that um, you're walking on a straight path in the virtual world, but the virtual world is turning as you're walking. And it's turning ever so slightly, so you tend to realign your body with the path, straighten up. So virtually you're going like this, but in the real world you're going like this without realizing it. But then the size of this circle is 22 meters radius, which is really large and not something that people have at home. And we are trying to build a system for consumer VR devices at home users. And we couldn't really use this technique because our space was three and a half meters square. And if you rotate the world in that much space, or that little space, it is so noticeable and immediately causes nausea. So we had to come up with a different way of doing this. And what we decided to do was instead of redirected walking, go with reorientation, which is when the user gets to the boundary of the physical space, that's the time you want to rotate the virtual world not do it continuously at all times. Now this introduces newer challenges. Because now we want to mask the rotation. We still have to rotate, um, just not continuously. And to mask the rotation, we uh, decided to use this cognitive illusion of inattentional blindness or perceptual blindness, which most everybody has, is this failure to notice something that's happening right in front of you when you're focused on something else. It's a very old experiment in psychology where they had users look at a video and count how many times a basketball was passed back and forth between the players, and then a person in a gorilla suit walks behind them and nobody noticed that gorilla suit passing. All right, so in order to make this work, we want them to interact with elements of the entire VR experience, which we call attractors. So not to put it in as just a mechanism of rotating the world, but actually make it part of the whole experience. We also designed some visibility control techniques since rotation is noticeable and you can see a lot of frames of reference or points of reference, we wanted to mask those as best as possible. And then, like I said, it's opportunistic reorientation or rotation. We don't do it all the time. All right, so to demonstrate how this whole setup works, we built a game, simple game, um, kind of like Pokemon, where you go to a park and your task is to collect information or about exotic birds and insects. So the goal is to walk from this point to point B. This distance is 16 meters, but you are limited to a three and a half meter square space. And so when the person starts out at point A and they get to this boundary of their safe space, we tell them that here's an exotic bird and look at it to collect data. And we also say pick up a pair of binoculars to look at it. So they pick up binoculars and then the bird is sweeping wide arcs in this space, right? The user is looking at it like this. 
they learn like this and like this and like this and the birds doing all sorts of things. And by the time they do a few turns, they've lost their original heading, right? They just, I don't know where they're facing, but they don't know. And if they've turned enough, we know they've turned enough. We rotate the warp when they're doing this, and all they can see is just the bird and maybe the top of a faded out tree. So there's not that many points of reference to tell them the world is moving. And so that happens, world's rotated, and now they're like, oh, I still have more space to walk, which they didn't know they didn't have more space to walk, right? They just see the path, and they continue walking. Um, and so, you know, you can, given the size of your physical space, you can calculate how many times you have to trigger these events to actually make them complete that whole path. Um, right down here, where this is the size of the square space, and this still is the length of the entire path one inch first. Um, we use these two values for rotation gain, like how quickly we want to rotate the virtual world. But prior studies have shown we don't want to go more than this. So if the user is rotating in the direction of the world rotating, it's a bit slower, opposite, a bit faster, because it's a lot more noticeable for people to notice rotation when it's in the opposite direction than when it is in the same direction. All right, so video shows an overview of all the visibility control techniques that we implemented. So we'll speed it up version. First person point of view, top down view, and the white square is the bounds of the physical space they're in. Oceanside Park, and we figured fog is okay for Oceanside Park. Here they're looking at a piece of amber. Almost there at point E. So here we're sort of simulating depth of field, but in Horton's work, we can use it, then we can actually have variable focus and depth of field, then that will just become natural. We won't have to simulate the load. All right, so of course, uh, it's VR, it's a user experience. You have to do a user study, and we wanted to investigate the effects of our techniques on the participants, their sense of presence, it's VR, um, how dizzy do they feel, and whether or not scene rotation was visible. And you can see that presence was about the same. And as I said earlier, presence is related to being able to walk around, which generally elicits that presence, and they walked in both experiences. Um, dizziness was overall generally low, again, because they're walking. Yeah? Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I was just curious. So you, I saw you kind of have them going like a square, a little bit offset. Did you find a limit to the amount of rotation that you could give one person, like rather than just having them kind of go diagonal corner to corner and doing No, we tried thing. different ways, and it was just the one implementation we did. We could, we had them walking around a curved path as well, slightly curved, and it wasn't very noticeable. In this case, it's just 90 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to get the maximum lengths that we can from any point where they are. But there's multiple different ways you could have them walk. You could just go back and forth along the diagonal, it would still be okay. I mean, it wasn't as, it wasn't noticeable to do like a 180 versus like a 190. Okay. <coughs> we're on purpose making them look around right. to do things, and I think that helped a lot. <coughs> All right, so overall dizziness, considerably low when using the, oh, I didn't really mention, the two conditions, in the with condition, the bird shows up and the binoculars show up. And in the without condition, the bird is still doing everything, but no binoculars. So the visibility control techniques are not there. And that's, in those conditions, the dizziness is fairly low. Um, and then we asked them to compare the noticeability, how obvious was the scene rotation, and it was significantly lower when using the visibility control techniques, which is kind of what we'd expect if you just don't have a point of reference. It's a lot harder to tell. Um, all right, so overall, just a quick summary that presence was high and dizziness was low, 
but the cognitive illusion and the idea of interacting with attractors essentially helped create a disruption-free experience. At no point did they end up getting too close to a couch, or if they did, they didn't know. They didn't have to worry about being too close to the wall or the couch, because we were manipulating their walking path and attention at all times. So we disabled the vibe, which what it has is a chaperone grid, which shows up every time you get to the boundary of your play space. And lastly, users successfully maintain the illusion of walking in a really long straight path relative to the physical space they were in. Um, so definitely getting a lot of proprioceptive feedback, they're walking, we don't need something like a 260 degree treadmill or something to enable free walking in a little space. And then lots of different applications that this can be used in. And no motion sickness, which is sort of critical for ER. All right, open column. What happens if people just don't want to interact and don't pick up the uh, binoculars to look at the bird and don't care about that and just want to continue walking, right? How do you handle events like that? I can make them backtrack. What happens if they walk way too fast? Because then they're gonna, our space is so little that if you walk really fast in three steps, you're gonna be at the end of the space. We just don't have enough time to give them a trigger or to do some interaction. Or if we do, then there's way too many interactions. The trigger is happening like this, and that can get really annoying after a bit. Yeah, that needs to be resolved. Um, walking on curved paths is, I was saying that we tried it, and it worked fairly successfully, but what if there's no path? What if you don't even know where the user wants to go? It's just last open sandboxy kind of space. How do you resolve that problem? Um, indoor space is possible, and there's another work that looks at a different kind of illusion called inattentional, well, not inattentional blindness. Um, what is it called? It's failure to notice something, change blindness. So it's like you walk into a room and the door is behind you. By the time you turn around, the door is at a 90 degree angle and you just forgot. Most people don't notice that that's where the door was. So that's what they did for indoor spaces. Um, and then how do you map all this? maybe to a real world space to actually enable virtual tourism in a way that it feels like, oh, I'm walking inside Notre Dame. I'm somewhere else in Paris or whatever on a mountaintop. How do you make that happen? All right. Lastly, okay, so in this work, we wanted to create a device we said earlier that can give you haptic feedback that is related to motion but it doesn't involve super large setups like 360 treadmills or body suits or exoskeletons of the sort. And so we built a small wearable device that can help us do that. Challenge in this case, or the problem that we want to solve was when you're in VR, a lot of the information you're getting is visual. And so the possibilities of whatever you can create in VR visually are practically endless. But what you can feel is a lot more limited. And in this case, you can see the racetrack, but most of the time you'll feel like you're sitting on your couch or standing in your living room, even if you're speeding down this virtual racetrack. And so that's that's a haptics related problem, not enough feedback. But that creates yet another problem, which is that there's a mismatch now between what your eyes are telling your brain and what your ears are telling your brain. And the sensory mismatch leads to motion sickness. Uh, so, our solution was to build a, to actually electrically stimulate the user vestibular system, which is the inner ear nerve that goes up to the brain and tells the user that their body's actually moving in order to make the senses match up. So this is sort of where you put the electrodes. All right, so essentially how the whole system of balance works, and it's often something everybody, most people take for granted, right? We don't have any problems walking on sidewalk, going to grass, coming back to sidewalk. Like you don't even think about all these things. And what's happening is that the brain is actually getting information from multiple sources, assimilating it, and then telling the motor and muscles what to do. And it gets information from the eyes. It gets information from your proprioceptive system, which is your body's muscles and joints, this internal sense you have of where your body parts are located. And it gets information from your vestibular system or your inner ear. 
So um, sensory information about motion, about equilibrium, about spatial orientation is sent by the vestibular system to the brain. And in each ear, the vestibular system is these three semicircular canals, and they are at right angles to one another, and then the utricle and the saccule. And they detect rotational movement in those axes, and the utricle detects linear, and saccule detects gravity. So things like sitting down and standing up, lying down and getting up, or moving forward and back, or you know, rotational issues, doing all these things. How does the brain know what's happening? So it makes sense that we stimulate that system to give you some sense of motion, right? And to do that, we built a wearable device. And in this specific case, we're electrically stimulating, and so it's galvanic vestibular stimulation, or GVS. But our device can handle different ways of stimulus, also like caloric or heat-based stimuli, which will also do something similar in your vestibular system, just affect different parts of it, um, and bone conduction, so other things. Um, and we also have, uh, so, ports to attach other sensors, so we can try to detect the onset of motion sickness, you know, heart rate or EDU, how can we correlate all that data? Figure out, try to prevent it before it starts a fight. I'm gonna skip the video. Um, if you use this study, you want to test and see how well the device works and whether or not motion sickness was lower and also how did the experience feel when you have that device um, attached to your to have your ears. And each participant did both trials, one with the device and one without the device of the same roller coaster experience with a little break in between. And this is a fairly short roller coaster experience, but it goes really fast and you know it can be Without GVS, people are essentially just falling. They don't really know. The body wants to move to manage what the visual data is telling me, but it just doesn't want to do. Um, and we created the roller coaster to not have any loops because we're only using two electrodes, and right now we don't know what sensations, how to recreate the ones you'll feel when you're upside down. Because the utricle, the sacchi will be upside down, so gravity will change. Gravity will not change your sensation <laughs> where you point to your chain. Um, and we asked a bunch of questions. We wanted to know presence, of course. There's a whole motion sickness questionnaire. And since it's a playful experience, we also wanted to see how well or what the playful experience felt like. Yeah, so this is a game experience questionnaire. And then lastly, we want to know whether or not GVS was liked or not, so people wanted to use it. And so presence was significantly higher when using the GVS device than without. And flow was also significantly higher. And flow essentially refers to, um, comes from Csikszentmihalyi's work in psychology, where this notion is that when you're doing any task that you're so absorbed in, you don't really realize how quickly time passes. Right? So you're just the challenge and your ability to meet at just the perfect point that it feels like five minutes have gone by, even though it could be ten hours later. And that's the state of flow that you get into. So we also looked at positive affect and negative affect just to see, you know, the system makes the people feel a lot worse than they by default are by probably doing something negative or worse. Um, so how do you measure flow? You just ask them. It's all questionnaire time. based, yeah. I mean, we we collected heart rate data and EDA data, but the heart rate sensor messed up like after about 14 people, so we just did not have enough data to actually analyze it. All we could test was that okay. A modular device works, we can plug and play sensors, and then it's all connected to an Android app and works over Bluetooth, so we could at least collect the data. It just wasn't good data. So uh, what's the difference between flow level two and level three? I, I don't have intuition for that. Flow level two? Is yeah, so so you said like these are all questions, right? So you Yeah, ask the, the questions user. are on a scale, and it depends on what the user tells you. It's, it's the difference between two and three is not like one unit more is the difference between three and four, right? It's a Likert scale, so the data is on a scale of less flow, medium, high flow. But the boundaries or the distinctions between those levels are not equal, because it's more perception-based. It's not, it's not mathematical, okay. in the sense that you know one and two is 
one level of fraud if it's a two and three is another yeah, one. I was trying to understand. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Lighter scale data essentially doesn't work like that. Most of the time you're looking at this sort of range that you're trying to gauge where it goes like that. Um, our motion sickness questionnaire <coughs> falls into lots of different types of categories, right? Nausea has to do with how you feel in your stomach, how queasy do you feel, and those are the questions related to that. Oculomotor is questions related to eye strain, blurred vision, headache, all those things. And then disorientation is more dizziness and vertigo. And overall, it was significantly lower when using the GPS device. And most people liked the experience when they were using the GPS device. And the general idea is that people like the experience because they could feel yet another sensation from VR, right? Default is just visual and audio, and this was something that you feel in your body. So even if you're standing like this, but the roller coaster is going like this, because we're stimulating a vestibular system, you will feel your body is going where the roller coaster is going, how it should go, how it matches, what it would happen in the real world. Um, right, so. did, did the subject know that um using a system that is supposed to help them? They knew so, that this so I'm is wondering a, if there's a placebo effect where like, oh yeah, it felt better because they know that the system is supposed so to. So we did counterbalance all our trials to make sure that there isn't a placebo effect. And in this case, the stimulation is just so needed and for such a short time. They knew that there is vestibular stimulation. They didn't know the purpose of it. They didn't tell them. They said that. For measuring signals because they had EDA and heart rate, everything attached. So, like current, does that make the participants feel like there's higher gravity in that ear or lower gravity? Gravity doesn't feel like it changes. It mostly feels like you're going like this or like this because we're applying current laterally, left to right or right to left, depending on the track. Oh, so left. To, so, if you apply current left to right, uh, will make. Will, do you simulate uh, like a turning right or turning left? Um, this way. You get pushed this way. Oh, okay. But both ears counterbalance. The way the vestibular system works, it's one ear turns around this way when you're rotating or when you're moving. The other side does the opposite thing. Yeah. Just normally does. So uh, will there be any health issues if we use this device for a long time? Yes! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so, GBS has been around since the 1800s, oh, okay. right? and medicine has been studied and used, and people are testing to see how it can help our balance issues and other problems related to gait and all that stuff. But so there's some standards published of how much to use. Different papers say different standards, like don't use it continuously for more than 20 minutes. But then I've seen a lot of papers where they use it 30 minutes at a time for multiple days. So, and then they also say don't go over two milliamps current, like we're using maybe 0.5 to one. And the model curve changes person to person. Um, but, you know, online you go and you can buy a TDCS device and be like five milliamps. So, there are no, I mean, you can only go buy papers that I've worked in medicine. I guess I'll find out in a few years, come talk to me then. <laughs> 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 I kind of got like two questions. One, did you do like a, any kind of like open response where you're justifying the simulation and asking people like what they felt? Or, because I'm kind of curious if the visuals really put into context that they're feeling something and it must be this. And I guess like the follow up to that is like, have you tried playing the signals in the opposite direction of the visuals and have people still. Well, I, like, I mean, I don't know, right? So, like, is it just the fact that there is a signal? and visuals put it into context, and so therefore they're just feeling something rather than before, where it's just visuals and there's nothing. Yeah. Like, I so guess these are... I've done some other work with GBS over the last two years, mm -hmm. and there is a work where, let me show you here. So in this case, the user is just looking down, and you see their trajectory turn, right, in mm -hmm. the anodal direction. And in this, they can't see anything. Mm -hmm. It's a dark VR world, it's all blank, and they're just looking down and um, that's how they turn. But they turned a fairly sharp turn and someone else who tested it with had a fairly shallow turn. There's nothing visual guiding them here. Um, 
that we actually use this to build the VR game where one person who's not in VR is remotely controlling a VR user around obstacles because the turning effect is fairly strong. Wait, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, did you uh, come up with like a mapping between uh, like the, the sensation of the linear in terms of how, if you vary the current, how much the sensation of the user gets? And so we did calibration for each user. Like I said, every person requires a different amount of current to feel some sensation. And we, uh, when we calibrated, we tried to calibrate a lower level when the person says, okay, I'm feeling something to a higher bound where like, they're not saying, oh, my ears are burning or anything, but they, it's it's a higher limit of what they want to tolerate. So it feels like a tingling sensation right here. It's not really bad, it's very minor, but it's still noticeable. At least when you use DC current. When we use a noisy GBX, then you don't feel anything. Uh, and then you don't even know the device is there other than you know that you have electrodes attached. Um, yeah, so we did do a calibration for each user and then when we mapped it to turns in the roller coaster, <coughs> turns that were more than 45 degrees, you know, we used a higher intensity at that point, and then turns that were a lot shallower, we used a lower intensity. And I think it could be much better mapped in terms of a gradient of what you apply. Um, but that's what we did for you know, getting the study done. So sorry for the you know, stupid question, but just to understand, this person is remotely controlled by another person. By another person, but just via the vestibular stimulation, yeah. or also by what they're seeing. They're so seeing nothing. So they're it's, seeing nothing yeah, now. It's just and darkness. It's just this thing that's yeah. causing them to wander. Yeah. And this thing works because they're looking down. And I think the head needs to be pitched 72 degrees and walking, so then you turn like this. But if you're looking straight up and walking, then you're just going to stagger. That's kind of like somebody pushed you, and that's not a very comfortable feeling. So um, why does it need that whole device on its tight like that? It's just the just blindfold the person. Oh, because we were this is sort of like a pretest for a VR game that we we're building. Okay. We just wanted to see how much we can make a person turn when they're looking down. So they don't need the VR device. All right. So you know, motion sickness is definitely it is it's the same problem, but. 30% of one in three people has extreme motion sickness, but it's also, I believe, going to be a big problem when there are self-driving cars and everybody's trying to read or work or do all sorts of things in the car, not look out correctly, you should. Um, space travel, we're testing it in a zero-g environment this semester to try to see what we can do because no gravity, this actual, what's it gonna do? It doesn't, it works on gravity, right? So how do we actually figure out how to help motion sickness. The state of the art right now for space travel and astronauts is training over several weeks, basically psychologically training them to just not pedal up, and <laughs> exposing them to some stimulus over time. And so that's sort of what they have to do right now. But so for that, you also have to stimulate the, whatever it's called, the skin in this axis? Yeah, so we can put more electrodes and stimulate in multiple axes, right? Two is just in this plane. But when we put a third one here, or one behind here, we can stimulate, um, we can simulate, you know, yaw, pitch, and roll, all of them, which then changes based on how quickly we're shifting current directions back and forth, back and forth, right? Instead of just applying in one direction. Because simulating this is kind of hard. Um, all right, so GBS actually is already used for therapy, rehab, and enhancing athletic performance where they don't use vestibular stimulation directly with electrical current, but they put you in a large kind of like a seat, like you have amusement park things where you just turn them around in all sorts of ways. Um, and then they have you point at a particular stimulus as quickly as you can, so pointing. Um, and more recently, you've started seeing work where they're looking at low levels of stimulus can actually impact higher brain function, right? Can impact things like um, facial recognition or tactile sensations or even memory. And that's sort of something we're looking at going into the future. So as you asked, right, finding the optimum simulation and what does optimum in, even mean? Because it is very contextual, it's what is happening. And finding better ways to even calibrate it when maybe people can self-calibrate the whole system. Um, being able to detect and predict motion sickness onset this is why we added a lot of other sensors to our device, so we are working on doing this, that we can um, personalize the device to a particular user. Because 
over time, motion sickness, you get used to. Even if in VR you get motion sick the first time, the first five times, or 10 times, over time, it'll get better. And if we're using a device, then the device will then need to evolve over time and you know, not apply the same amount of stimulus each time. Um, so personalizing it. Um, implicit versus explicit use, should the user actually say, all right, I wanna put some current in my head or should the system automatically figure out it should do it because it feels like based on other sensor data, it's the right time to do it. And then how do we retrofit existing apps that are on the app store that are motion sickness inducing and um, make it work with a device? Because new apps, we can incorporate it. We're working on an API to do that, but we can also work on retrofitting older apps now. So there. All right. So coming back, I guess, to what I started out with, I don't know, maybe you guys are wondering what is, what does HCI have to do with um, information sciences or what is an HCI person doing given a talk in an information theory forum? And I believe, I guess my question is, how is it, how is my work not related to information, right? When you look at, this is all the things that my work requires doing, you know, process information, you want to transmit it, whether you compress it or don't compress it, depends on how quickly you want it getting somewhere. You definitely want to communicate between devices, between user and the system, and um, how are we representing information? How are we changing it from one thing to the other? Is electrical stimulation changing, or biosignals are changing into electrical signals, or something else is changing into visual data or audio data, or the other way around? And then how is it actually being used at the other end by the user? What are they doing with that information? Um, similarly, what types of devices are we using? What types of sensors are we using to collect all this data that then we can manipulate as we need to? <coughs> Biosignals could be anything from physiological signals, to neuro signals, um, anything that we want to use and you know, translate into other things. You know, circuits definitely need those boards. And then process all the data. We definitely need that algorithm to solve all of this. So ultimately, it is all information related. Broadly speaking, HCI as an area sort of intersects with a lot of other areas. Like you saw, some of my work was cognitive science. I'm looking at cognitive illusions. There's definitely computer science. I mean, I have work where I'm using a lot more machine learning and deep learning to generate virtual environments. There's engineering, we're building boards, we're doing all the things um, that we need to do. And, you know, psychology and design, what is the interface that people are using to interact with these things that we're building? And we zoom in on HCI and engineering connection or information. And, you know, same thing as highlighted before, just to zoom in view, we got the devices, we got the signals, we want to collect the signals with sensor, we want to process the data, we have algorithms when we need them to process the signals, um, and then finally come out with something that users can utilize in ways that they need to, or whatever the problem it is that we're trying to solve or the experience we're trying to build. Um, all right, so on that note, I think I'm going to stop talking, and feel free to ask questions. Translations I've seen a lot less working, but I think, I mean, we were doing one direction, right? We put electrodes here, we can at least and, do and this that's just by 
So the gradient of the current, which way it goes and through the electrode? Or? So it's, it's direction and how quickly we're putting current between these two. So if there's more than two electrodes, right, one here and one back yeah. here, is are we going this direction or back direction, or are we going back and forth like this or back and forth like this? By changing that, you can simulate um, motions in all their axes. But this one is fairly direct, right? This yeah. one, we're actually manipulating the horizontal center of the L canal right. to do this, or we use a bulb. I guess my internal way of how I thought it worked before, and maybe that's wrong, is that you're basically directly tapping into the nerve and putting a broad band signal into these different nerves. But so I just don't see how the vestibular nerves are in the front of the head, I guess. There's one, the eighth cranial nerve that goes up, it's connected to your ocular motor signals, okay. your auditory system, and your vestibular system, it's all a single nerve. And so when you're simulating, it is not as precise as we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. You're stimulating a lot of stuff inside and it's all the same nerve. Um, but the different types of stimuli that we've implemented, so if you use caloric, which is warm or cool stimulation, what it does is it heats up the air in your middle ear, which then warms up or cools down the fluid which is in the semicircular canals. And it's the fluid that sloshes every time you rotate and causes hair to move along inside the fluid. And the hair are then connected to a nerve that goes up to the brain. So you can change the viscosity of the fluid? Yes, like temperature. Uh, so hot or cold. If, I mean, I don't know if you've ever gone to a doctor and gotten your ears irrigated or something. Yeah. Like immediately you get dizzy like that. Uh -huh. You can see it. There's nothing. And like I said, we're also trying some, because it's um, how bone conduction will do the same thing. <coughs> it's just which of those systems is getting manipulated. Electrical is, of course, the fastest, right? And caloric is a bit slower. So is there potential to more directly stimulate the nerves? I mean, we can go invasive. We don't want to yeah, poke no, holes in invasive. the tympanum. Not invasively. <laughs> <laughs> not invasively, you're saying you're stimulating some of the nerves indirectly through first essentially heating the fluid yeah. that then moves and stimulates. Yeah, so electrical is more direct than the fluid, than the heating or the cooling. Like we can use cold water or hot water or however we want to change the temperature. Um, but the problem is that the whole system medically even isn't fully understood, like what exactly is happening, why? Because the audio system is also connected, right? So we must be doing something to the auditory while we're doing stimulation of the vestibular system, it's the same nerve. Eye muscles move around a lot. Now if you ever do vestibular stimulation, Look at the person's eyes. You see it pushed around like this, you know, and uh, it's all connected. I mean, ultimately, it has to be connected, right? Every time I turn my head, my eyes go the other way to give me a stable view of the world. It's the same system, um, which I mean, it is. All right.